And it reminds me of kind of the early days of the beginning of the DeFi run. When I say early days, I'm not talking about years ago, I'm talking about really days ago, a couple of months ago, and it feels like a decade or two ago uh, because so much has happened. Uh, but hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, Chainlink always stayed bullish, but of course, not consistently, right? It had a little pullback, that's okay. Uh, and what we're gonna be talking about is the strength of Chainlink, what it means for the larger DeFi and Oracle uh, segments of the altcoin space. And of course, what I believe as a strong signal here that we could be in Oracle season. And of course, the Oracle season has grown, developed, blossomed, and expanded since we first started covering it several months ago. And that's really good, to be honest, because the more competition there are, it means that there's going to be more opportunities in the market. And while it is great that Chainlink is kind of the Ethereum of this space, Chainlink really presents so many opportunities and has been so generous over the last few years, but it also opens up the opportunity for the Pepsis, as I like to say. Now, I made this comparison back when I first started talking about band at about you know $2 or something. And Band eventually went to $15, pulling a really nice growth there. Uh, but the same argument is that, especially with oracles, oracles are all about data, validating data, and having trust in that data that comes from off-chain to bring it on-chain and essentially validate some very, very significant financial applications and their functions within smart contracts. The data can range from you know, price information to certain events, the outcome events, if we're talking about you know, prediction markets. And so having very accurate data is critical. And in the decentralized world, you would imagine that having more than one Oracle is also a significantly important thing for making sure that data is essentially valid. Having consensus across multiple Oracles or many Oracles potentially dozens of oracles might actually be the way that this entire ecosystem functions in the future. Now, while any one project could potentially produce multiple oracles, the reality is that a truly decentralized ecosystem should be taking in information from a wide variety of sources. And for that reason, having multiple successful and strong oracle ecosystems in the blockchain world, I believe, is a strong foundation and uh, a framework for a successful Oracle category. And so with that in mind, having multiple Oracles to me is a given. Just because Chainlink works doesn't mean we need to throw out everything else, right? It's not, uh, it's not that simple. And to me, it really opens up the doors for second, third, fourth, and fifth movers in the space to end up taking market share. And that's a tremendously generous opportunity for the people in this community. Now, full disclaimer and disclosure, the altcoin market is extremely risky, hard to play. You need to be paying full attention to it as it moves extremely fast. You can go from zero to 100 and back to zero very quickly. And so if you're not willing to... Uh, essentially pay attention to it full time and manage your tokens and your investments full time, then I humbly ask you to uh, seek for less risky uh, opportunities in the space. So with that said, I do want to move on to the fact that I am quite bullish and have been optimistic that this dip would have been some of the best opportunities that this market has given us in years. Now, of course, if you had the foresight to buy into DeFi projects while everything was dead and dying at the end of 2019 and go heavy into coins like Aave and Synthetics, uh, Compound Maker, obviously Compound, actually their token wasn't even out. But if you were able to bet on DeFi with the chain links and the DeFi majors that were obviously suffering throughout the end of 2019, well, you would have been rewarded tremendously. But this pullback that we had, this kind of market collapse at the end of August has presented yet another op opportunity, right? The risk is that we don't go back up, that we don't form newer highs, that this DeFi bull run was just a flash in the pan. However, I've pulled up the 2016 comparisons, and remember, on the four-year cycle, that is cryptocurrencies as dictated by Bitcoin. Well, the reality is that we have to have some correlation to the previous cycle. And if we look at the previous cycles, we see that there was a mini altcoin renaissance in 2016, very, very similar, eerily similar in the timing to the 2016 DeFi altcoin run. And the pullback, the kind of collapse or settling of that, along with the growth of Bitcoin pushing towards its old all-time high, well, all of these things happened in 2016. And so while the past is by no means an indication of what will guaranteed happen in the future, it provides provides us some kind of framework to analyze. That's where we get the plan B stock to flow ratio. That's where we get the difficulty bands, the compression and expansion of those bands. That's where we get um, 
pretty much all of the logarithmic predictions for Bitcoin's price and the growth of the crypto industry is from an analysis of past price and uh, uh, performance. So with that in mind, the reality is that I'm looking for the potential for this next year or so, so to be incredibly bullish for the alts that have been trending. Now, will all alts eventually rocket like they did in 2018? Well, that could happen. But I certainly think that the way to build repeatable sex, success, not financial advice, but the way to build repeatable success is to understand which metrics and which projects are most exciting to the community. One of the things beyond just doing fundamental analysis on projects to find out which teams and products I think will go to market and have success is to understand what you know really the x factor or the hype in the community is going to be supporting and we know for a fact that those narratives are pretty clearly defined around oracles DeFi, interoperability pretty much anything on ethereum that seems like it's going to fit the bill as far as you know DeFi yield farming and these other things um, and understanding which of those categories are the high risk plays the more short term flash in the pan pump and dump kind of coins and understanding that if you're in these high risk plays that if you are are doing very well and you're up significantly that you want to take profits. Whereas if you're in more long-term plays like Oracles, like Link, uh, projects like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Polkadot, right, you understand that those short-term pumps might just be the precursor to something much more long and sustainable. So with that in mind, I wanted to go in and discuss what I think of as some of the most exciting opportunities seeing Chainlink pump today and over the last few days, breaking its trend and starting to look bullish and strong. Well, if this is the signal for a new Oracle season, well, then there are some pretty obvious opportunities that should do well in its wake as we saw the first time around when Oracle season first peaked its head back in July and August. So with that said, 736 people in the house. Go ahead, guys, and smash that like button if you guys are excited for this episode. And of course, remember that each and every comment on this video is entered to win a free Ledger Nano S, but that giveaway is for subscribers only. So if you're not subscribed, hit that bell notification. Make sure you subscribe and put the notifications to all so that way you're made aware whenever I put out new content. With this market heating up again, it's time for coins list, low cap gems, and we all know that these small coins can tend to move pretty quickly. So if you want to be the first ones to know about it, put that bell on and make sure you set the notifications to all. That's the way to be the first one. You can go in my Telegram groups, in my Twitter groups, or not Twitter groups, but you can follow pretty much anyone who I talk to, and they know that I do not reveal the coins that I'm going to cover until they go live here on YouTube. I think that's the fairest way to do it. There's not really a 100% easy, fair way to cover coins, but I want to make it as fair as I can. And I want my YouTube audience to be really the first people to know about when I think something's valuable. And that way there's not like some kind of VIP or exclusive kind of access to information. I, I believe in a fair distribution of inf information. So that's why I do things this way. And if you agree with that, if you like that, if you support that, then go ahead and give me a sub and make sure you put that bell on. With that said, let's dive in and start looking at some charts, looking at some altcoins, because things are starting to get really, really exciting here. And could we? Yep. All right. Tech is my friend once again. Here we are in the Chainlink chart, guys. And it's a beautiful thing to see Chainlink up another, you know, over 5%, 6% here. If we just look here at the last 90 days, you know, or even the last 180 days, we see, you know, an amazing growth here where we see it bubbling up. Actually, let's go to a whole year. Yeah. So we see these, these runs that Chainlink has done. And it goes up, you know, parabolically, 10x here. It comes back down goes up parabolically here, back up to that prior high, barely eclipses it, but gets over it. Then we get the, uh, this is the crash from the early COVID uh, pandemic news. And I hope that me saying that word doesn't flag this broadcast. It's so weird here on YouTube, guys. You have no idea what a weird minefield it is navigating these demonetizations and the, and the censorship here. Uh, it's a crazy, crazy world we're in. However, we get this huge flash crash here that comes with the market flash crashing because of the beginning of the pandemic. And who knows, maybe Link would have just continued this, this stride up if not for that. It's hard to really predict because we know stimulus was extremely helpful and generous to the, this whole ecosystem. But then we get it pushed back down, but it really rapidly within the space of about a month or two gets back up to its high. And then we get parabolic price discovery. And we see this amazing movement here where Link just starts jumping from about three and a half bucks all the way up to at its peak, almost 20 bucks. 
that's crazy, right? To have a, a, a project in the billions of dollars in market cap doing a 7X. I mean, you're not seeing this kind of price action on coins since like Ethereum. You did see stuff like that with NEO, with Bitcoin, but you know, Chainlink has now entered into a very unique category. And if you know what's going on here, it's all about data, access to data, and authenticity of data coming into smart contracts. Chainlink really pioneering this, this model, if you will. Um, but regardless, it's really exciting to see Chainlink's growth and development here. And seeing it then come off this parabolic move, well, it looks a lot like the last times it came off this parabolic move and then started to build strength again. We can see the cupping pattern already starting to form here. Um, and then this move, after it broke the downtrend, starts to seem like Link's building strength once again. And as Link builds strength, we need to keep in mind the other coins that have been so, so generous as part of this Oracle narrative. Remember what I said, if you're really a believer that oracles are going to essentially provide access to authentic and reliable data, well, the crypto community is not known for relying on just one source of data, one source of mining power, one source of governance. It's all about decentralization. And I'm not saying that Link can achieve you know, data decentralization within itself, but come on guys, we know that there's going to be a demand for multiple Oracle solutions, even if there's nested Oracle solutions within those. For that reason, I believe the market will value the Pepsis, as I'm calling them. In this case, Pepsi of the, ban of the Oracle category is banned. And banned here has 134 million market cap, whereas Chainlink has a $5 billion market cap. So we're looking at almost a 30X here for uh, band to get to where Chainlink is. And I'm not saying it ever will. I don't think it'll ever catch up to or eclipse Chainlink, but maybe if Chainlink ends up expanding to you know the tens of billions, maybe there's a narrative here where band can get to a billion dollars or you know one to two billion, I don't know. But what I like to see here is first movers and second movers in the market. Remember, we identified certain trends going back to the core uh, trends, going back to the Oracle trends. We've seen that identifying the second mover, third mover, especially in cryptocurrency, is a super powerful uh, template, a super powerful framework to evaluate the market because we've seen that giving direct hard values to uh, cryptocurrencies is extremely, extremely hard. And so having a way to um, having a way to in some way value these cryptocurrencies is mostly a game of relatives. So you're saying, okay, well, I think the market could be this for this category, and there's already a coin that's done this much growth. So this one in this category with this narrative in this cycle, well, maybe it could catch up or approximate that value. And that's just the reality is that pricing and valuing cryptocurrencies is extremely hard, and we're all expecting parabolic growth upwards. So putting you know what could be seen as exorbitantly high price points on certain assets is just accepted more readily in crypto, which is why you get these parabolic movements. It seems like sometimes things just can't quit in their path up. We know that that's not true. But in reality, seeing this band at 134, there is a narrative for it making a move to catch up to the almost 30x gains that it would have to do to catch up to Chainlink. Then we have another favorite of the channel, Dia, which we covered here at a $5 million market cap. It's now at a $35 million market cap. Part of that is because they released a lot more coins, so that's not really the most positive. However, they're only here at $1.30, um, and this peaked up at about three bucks. But look at this thing. As Chainlink's making its move, boom, right on schedule, we get another very, very uh, well-liked Oracle. Right after it had its you know, parabolic run-up, after we covered it, it peaked out at about four bucks, a little over four bucks, 4.30, wow. Uh, and then we bottomed out here at about a dollar, back where we first found it, and now we're going up again. Um, and so if we do go up again here, we can see how generous cryptocurrency can be with the pullbacks, essentially allowing for you to get yet another ride on the same generous project, especially ones that are fundamentally sound and in trending narratives and have you know the hype around them like these oracles do the oracles are arguably the tip of the spear with DeFi projects as you know there's just significantly less of them they're needed by all DeFi projects and yet they're even bigger than DeFi in many ways there's comparisons between Chainlink and ethereum for being sort of the originators of their categories however this is what i see as a really nice signal that hey maybe we're turning the ship around here with the dias looking at band you know it's 134 million dia well, it would have to do about a four, 
a 4x to catch up to where band is. So 400% to catch up to something that would need to 30x to catch up to the, pro, uh, the category leader. Are these numbers guaranteed to play out? Of course not, not at all. But seeing these growth points, seeing the expansion of the category and the potential for something like this to grow and catch up to one of its not even first movers in the category, but a second mover, that's extremely bullish and exciting. And you see the market responding to that today. Um, and so as we're looking, we also have DOS, right? DOS is another, uh, in my opinion, you know, lower down. I, I actually heard of some FUD with DOS. I haven't checked tremendously up on the FUD with DOS. I don't know whether or not it's valid, but I said before that this is one of the higher risk ones and we can see that in the market cap as well. Uh, they have an under 10 million market cap. At one point, we covered this at about 2 million market cap very early on. And you know, I explained that it was high risk, high reward. And wouldn't you know it, the market sort of validated that. It shot up to literally almost 40 cents here Look at that market cap view so you can really get a sense of this. Um, it shot up to 50 million market cap from 2 million market cap. That's a 25x. That might be the, uh, one of the biggest gainers that we talked about here on the channel over the last few, uh, over the last few months. Um, but you can see now it's come way, all the way back down to earth almost. Sitting, you know, it was sitting at about a $4 million market cap. Now it's about eight. Uh, it dipped down to six here. So if this goes onward and upward again, I mean, how generous is it to give you two potential you know, rocket rides? Is it guaranteed to happen? Absolutely not. Uh, absolutely not. There's no such thing as a guarantee when you're multiplying money like that. However, the opportunity there for a new Oracle season is tremendous. We see that in DOS, we see that in DIA, we see that in BAND. And probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite on this list, is Teller. And that's because Teller is significantly more decentralized than the other Oracle solutions. That's also been a negative in that their system is slower to function, which sort of has bottlenecked their resources. However, they recently released a Teller V2 and actually a Teller, a Teller V2.5 uh, very quickly thereafter. And you can see there they're sitting at a market cap of 43 million, which is still 67% down. You can think of this as an easy 3x back to its highs. Um, and remember, I was talking about Teller being, in my opinion, oversold as it was dipping all the way down here into the $13 category. I first started really talking about Teller um, at about uh, a while back, but I said that, hey, this sell-off at around 30 bucks is looking juicy. And then I kept saying as it was dipping, it was getting even juicier, seeing it turn around. And now, you know, all the, all the oracles kind of pivoting at once. It seems to be that there's a trend here. We can see it breaking through this prior high, forming a newer high. Um, higher highs and higher lows, right? That's how you identify a trend. And so if this is the new trend, well, it to me would be extremely generous, right? If we've seen this kind of generosity where Teller went from, here, Teller went from, what was this, five bucks up to 75, maybe it's not gonna be that generous, but it came down 15. So if it even goes back to prior highs, right, you're looking at from its low here, that was like a seven X, right? Or, or a five X rather. Uh, really, really generous, really, really, really generous. And then the kind of wild card bet here, which I've been talking about, which is OctoFi. And so the biggest thing here is that this is an anonymous team, which I don't like. They seem to think it's necessary. I don't. Um, I would love to see them dox themselves and take responsibility. Who cares if they're going to turn it over to the community? Um, but, you know, I kind of said that this was kind of a meme play. I I don't know how to identify, you know, I don't think this is as much of a fundamental play as much as a hype play where I could see them sort of riding the Oracle uh, hype train. Uh, the team is passionate. They're passionate, but, you know, uh, they did pop all the way up here to about 20 bucks. We covered it right here at about six bucks. Uh, it did a, over a three X. Um, and so, you know, some some very generous movements there. Um, and then it's come back down, not quite down to where we originally covered. I guess it did come all the way back down. And so is it going to go back up? run it back. Remember Oracle's, uh, or I guess uh, Octo was not around when all these other Oracles were peaking. So this all happened in September, whereas all these other Oracles were peaking in August. So it kind of wasn't playing in sync with the other Oracles. So this is a huge opportunity because at a 3 million market cap, it's extremely low. I think it's the lowest of any of them. Yep. Let's see what DOS is. DOS is 8 million. So in order uh, from lowest to highest, we have uh, Octo, then we have, sorry, we have Octo, DOS, DIA, Teller, Band, and Chainlink. And that's the sort of uh, scale you get from what you could see as the riskiest all the way up to the sort of most solid projects in the Oracle space. Now, I still believe there's probably a lot of gains to be had in Chainlink itself. This is the king, and you can never underestimate really what something like the Coca-Cola of the category, if you will, 
can accomplish. Um, but if Oracle season is to take off in full flight, this is where I'm gonna be directing my attention. I encourage you guys to do your own research. Again, I can do my research, I can use my spidey senses, but I'm just one guy in the end and you always have to do your own research and learn to analyze, make your own decisions, and I encourage you guys to do so. So that's how I'm viewing this whole Oracle season phenomenon. If it is to repeat, ooh, how generous it is. And this was really one of the first, you know, bullets or shots fired of the DeFi movement. And so seeing Chainlink sort of start to get bullish again, start to really break its trend and turn onwards and upwards, obviously if it makes new highs, that would be super, super bullish for the space. But it's important to be focusing on these things before you get full confirmation because once something is too obvious, you miss the opportunity. It's always the way it is with crypto. And the fact is that there's a lot of degenerate gamblers in this industry that are willing to sort of put their coins uh, into a, a, a hunch before things are fully proven. So that's just kind of the way the industry works. Uh, but regardless, Chainlink, Band, Teller, Dia, you know, of all these, Teller is a real sweet spot to me. Um, but then you also have Dia, DOS, and Octo, all very good. I have a lot of Band already. Um, Chainlink, obviously, I've been having my Linky my linky links for quite a while. Uh, regardless, that's how I'm viewing the Oracle season. I'm curious what you guys think. I'll hop into some Q&A for a second. Um, and then we'll talk about another project that's actually implementing Oracles as well um, in a very different way. But I think it could potentially benefit from this. Uh, these are such high risk coins. Um, okay. I don't understand the actual value of an individual coin. You create value life being an oracle at what price? I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, does anyone have any questions about oracle season? Any thoughts on easy? I like easy. Had a huge pump yesterday. Thoughts on anarchy? I actually invested in anarchy. Um, I know that they have some stuff coming up. I don't know if they're released yet. I need to check back in. But I invested in anarchy. I think it's cool. Just like, you know, I think it could catch some of this NFT hype wave. Um, again, doesn't solve the big issues with NFTs at all, but I think it's a cool project. Um, I also just, I'm a sucker for cyberpunk stuff, so uh, that's kind of their, their aesthetic. Um, Mantra Dow, no, I'm not going to talk about Mantra Dow today, but I, you know, I think that there could be a resurgence of the Polkadot ecosystem for sure. Still bullish on Acro, yep, Polka, DeFi, I think that'll make a huge comeback. CryptoLark says he thinks one TRB will equal one ETH. I personally think that that could easily happen. Tre uh, Teller is just a really, really good project. Really, really good. Am I longing on Link? Yeah, I mean, well, I just have like hodls. I have like Link hodls. I literally have my Linkies and I just sit on them. I don't touch them. I don't trade them. Um, Albert Thoughts, Elio? Yeah, I actually bought into the Albert uh, sale. So I think that they have a good product, uh, but we'll see, uh, we'll see how they roll it out. But I'll definitely be covering it. I'm excited for Albert. And Ocean, ooh, Ocean is so solid. You know, Ocean, RSR, Link, Oracles in general, uh, I think they're going to do really, 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 really well. Um, is DOS the Asian narrative? Yeah, I don't know if I would call it that, but can DOS hit 50 cents? Didn't it already hit 50 cents? Um, I'm not sure if it hit 50 cents. I think 40 cents was where it peeped out. Yeah, so 38. Could it? Yeah, sure. Anything could happen. In a bull run, the prices get crazy. That's just kind of how it works. Um, Nest protocol uh, seems all right, but I'm going to actually introduce what I think of as a, a potentially more interesting protocol than that right now, um, not to compare and contrast as they're very different. But yeah, Ocean, RSR, Chainlink, they're all very fundamentally strong projects. And I love when fundamentally strong projects pump. It gives me life, gives me hope. When you see just Uniswap casino coins pumping and nothing else, Kind of, kind of kills my vibe because it doesn't validate the good things in the market. It kind of is like incentivizing bad behavior. Elliot, I guess that you've seen it. I see Teller pumping since 10 days, but you've seen the daily trailing volume comparison with other oracles. Thanks for your work. Um, yeah, I haven't compared the volume, um, but I have been looking at the price. It's been pumping for sure. And like I said, I've been bullish on the coins that I started covering in September. I love those projects. And September was a bad month for DeFi and altcoins, but it doesn't change the underlying fundamentals. And that's what's powerful about when you have FA analysis as your primary lens. When you're looking at things from just a short-term sort of flash in the pan uh, type hype train things, like a lot of these Uniswap casino coins, as I'm calling them, the DGEN plays. Um, and a lot of these yield farming plays are essentially, 
they're set up quite a bit like Ponzi's, and that's why they pump and dump, because after the yield has been extracted, uh, it's hard to get them to pump again. And so uh, I like to look at things. Yeah, Uniland I'm really excited for. Um, I have a, a big bag of Uniland. I'm very excited for what they have going on. And like I said, I did that video on Unistake. I'm very excited for what Unistake's doing as well. Um, I'm holding both of those projects and talking with the teams. Uh, they have some. They each have exciting things coming up. And so as those exciting things come up, I'm going to be pushing them and, and covering them. Um, but yeah, when, when I cover a, a coin, I usually am pretty committed. I'm usually pretty committed uh, because I, it's not that I fall in love with them. It's just if there's a good coin that still hasn't gotten love from the market, I see that as an opportunity. I'm not going to be right all the time, um, but I'm going to be right enough of the times that it really, really works out. And that's been my strategy is oftentimes when things look really bleak, I start investing just like I've been telling you guys sort of not financial advice, but I've been looking at these dips as really juicy for the last you know few weeks as a lot of people have been doubting potentially the future of the altcoin market, saying DeFi's dead, all this stuff. I've been, you know, getting my deeper and deeper bags. Uh, yeah, the core proposal of ERC 95s are cool. Uh, but again, in and of itself, isn't going to pump the price of Core. It's an interesting, interesting project. But I don't think that makes Core necessarily an oracle just yet, um, a coracle. But uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I definitely have my eyes on Core. But seeing its lack of price performance, even after their sort of innovative touch, just shows you that these tokenomics projects, as I call them, these tokenomics projects that are just strictly tokenomics, uh, they have a, a tough road. They have a tough road. We see, you know, if you zoom out on Core's chart, we see this huge pump up. We see a huge pump and now we're seeing it kind of struggle, right? Um, does this, could it go up to higher and higher highs? I certainly hope for the core community it does. I'm not fudding or whatever. I just, when things are just strictly around tokenomics and kind of yield and whatever, it, it doesn't sit well with me because I believe products are the things that actually create long-term sustainability. And so when I see products, that's what I like to see. Uh, as of yet, I don't see core as a product. I see it as a tokenomics sort of model. And that, that'll bring me, I'll talk about another tokenomics coin that is actually pretty interesting uh, in just a little bit here. Um, but we have uh, a comment about Nintendo and Atari farming live today with Retro Farm. Um, interesting. I'll need to look into that. Thank you for the super chat, Rob Moore. Title on Polkadot. I haven't looked into the title, guys. Uh, Falcon Swap update. As I know, they're very, very close to pushing their main net. So when they do, I'll be happy to talk about it, but I'm not going to cover it before then. Uh, Ave, yes, of course, Ave, always, always Ave. Um, thoughts on second layer scaling Matic? Uh, I like Matic. I have a good relationship with their team. I've been following their tech, considering it for my own project. Uh, but you know, second layers face a UX problem of getting people over to the second layer. You know, and and in the end, nothing will accomplish the goals of you know essentially making things easy for products to be usable and have tons of liquidity, tons of accessibility, like being on Ethereum mainnet. It's just, that's where everybody in the world wants to be. That's where all the investors are, that's where all the users are, and even the highest fees and, and congestion in the world didn't stop that. And so, yeah, where, where are the problems with Dia? I didn't say there were problems with Dia. Is it a, com the graph, is it a competitor to Parsec? I'm actually not sure, thanks for the super chat. Uh, the graph? Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe just graph. Unigraph? I don't know if this is what you're talking about. I don't want to just talk about some some terrible coin here. Uh, but yeah, people are want to talk about Parsec. Guys, I did an interview with the team yesterday, and the point of this interview was really to help them, because I've been talking with them throughout this whole uh, incident, and the point was to try to help them explain to the community what the heck happened uh, with this flash crash and their hack and all this stuff. Now, I personally think that that video says it all. I encourage you guys to go see it. Um, but I've also been, you know, they're telling me about stuff that's coming up and it's super exciting and it validates everything that I've believed about this project from day one. And you'll just have to wait until they put that news public. It's not my choice to release that news, but I'm super excited about what they have uh, coming down the pipe as I think they really, really are getting recognized for the quality of their technology and team. And so, you know, Parsec is not quite a competitor to these oracles right now. Uh, it could in the future start adding more, um, you know, middleware technology as they f sort of originally communicated to me. But I think they're really finding a niche right now with their on-chain data, uh, WYSIWYG uh, sort of complex workflows. There's a lot to love here with PRQ. And so they're going to do some tokenomics updates, product updates, and huge partnership updates in the near future. Keep your eyes peeled. I'm very excited what Parsec has going on. Again, uh, Dia, Parsec, 
uh, both gems that I put up on the channel and have done incredibly well, and I'm extremely, extremely happy with that. Um, let's see here. So now I wanted to talk about Hathor Network. And Hathor Network is not an oracle, um, but you can see here that they have... Um, They have some Oracle functionalities built in. Uh, built in atomic swaps. Um, and yeah, okay. And so they also have an easier and safer implementation of smart contracts, which connects real world data oracles. So this is a non Ethereum network. This is a completely unique and individual blockchain, Hathor network. Um, but they are coming out with a really interesting project. And it's been really, really hard to trade this thing because it's on just like the worst exchanges and was previously only available uh, on OTC through their Discord, which is like, even I don't like doing that kind of stuff. Um, but they're on this Q trade. I've never been on Q trade. They only have $21,000 worth of volume. They pretty much are waiting on a real listing here. Um, but this is a fundamentally pretty strong pla uh, project uh, that is a super scalable, easy to use blockchain, super mobile friendly. Uh, they famously had a 14 year old create their own coin on a mobile wallet within like five minutes. Um, so there's a lot of usability things, super scalable and all that. The biggest opportunity, the biggest issue here is that getting people again off of Ethereum is really, really hard. And so that's going to be their big, you know, obstacle. But um, as far as full adoption, uh, you're going to have to work hard to convince me that this is going to get fully adopted. However, I could see this thing getting some some serious hype over the next few months, and you know, hype tends to lead to some serious you know upward volatility. Now that said, I bring them up because they're using a, uh, a built-in oracle, kind of like Polkadot is doing as well. They also have built-in atomic swaps and super low or non-existent fees. Uh, so I just wanted to put this guys uh, on your on your uh, radar, which is Hathor Network, because I think that there's really something here. They're using a hybrid DAG and blockchain technology. As you can see here, they have the DAG off to the sides as well as the blockchain in the middle, and so. That's how they're sort of structuring it. If you guys don't know what DAG is, it's essentially a different type of distributed ledger where they keep the security, but it allows for more uh, scalability, flexibility. The most famous DAG projects are you know, IOTA, and there's other DAG projects, several other ones as well. But this technology is very interesting. I could see, you know, it seems like they've been working on it for several years, and it seems like they've delivered some interesting tech. Again, we've seen a lot of Ethereum killers. I would call this an Ethereum killer as well. Um, but they're also talking about extended ERC uh, token capacities. And they're talking about, you know, in my opinion, I don't know whether this is them trying to interoperate with Ethereum. Um, but I'm going to be doing some more deep dives into Hathor in the coming days. I was impressed with what I saw, and I've picked up my own bag of it. So uh, it's very, very annoying to get their hands on. But that, to me, is another opportunity because I could see this thing getting much more popular once it hits a more mainstream exchange. Like, look at this trash Q, Q, Q trade. Come on, 21,000 in volume. Like, I'm not even clicking on this link. So uh, it's one of those interesting opportunities that I think the market will uh, start to recognize once it's on a better exchange. So this is something I wanted to put on your on your radar uh, and something that I've just gotten my own bag of. So very interesting stuff. And then just looking at, you know, coins that we've been talking about, you know, over the last few months, you know, you can see Teller, Octo, and Dia all clocking uh, gains, similar gains, right? So this is proof to me that there is an Oracle movement that's, you know, these coins are all literally within spitting distance of their percentage gains and, and differences over the last few days. And then we see Chainlink, you know, obviously it had a little better of the day before, but I think that there's some validity to this argument that Oracle season is upon us and that's an extremely generous time uh, to be accumulating these assets. Uh, moving on, we're going to talk about tokenomics projects, and I just want to say before I get to this next project, I am not in any way, hold on, I got a $10 super chat, Baidu. Um, so, you know, uh, Baidu, I'm on a wait and see. I want to see them deliver their product a little more, but I will look on it. Pink Summer, I know you've been uh, super chatting me about this for a while, so I'll definitely check in uh, on Baidu in the future, but I need to look into it more. There were some things that I didn't like about, uh, when I looked into it last, but I will check back in on it and I don't want to FUD or anything. I just want to give me some time to do some research. Thanks again for the super chat pink summer. Please look into Koval's tokenomic circuits of value. Now I did look at this. They were using NFTs to represent baskets of assets. It kind of like popped onto the scene during the NFT hype. I'm a little weary of it as it's like a five-year-old, six-year-old project or something crazy like that. Um, but it's definitely something I'm going to check out. So thanks for that, Stephen uh, Nagel. 
Um, Pink Summer, again, Bida already training on Poloniex, Who, L Bank, and Uniswap. Thanks again for the super chat, Pink Summer. Um, so before I go into this next project, this is something that was buzzing around the, the DGEN scene, if you will. This is just the reality, is that it's a very DGEN coin. Um, and I think that any project that is sort of exclusively based on its tokenomics is uh, uh, essentially your gambling because it's not based upon a product usage that can be consistent and grow users over time. It's based upon hype, uh, supply, and demand factors. It's purely a speculation game. In my opinion, that makes it quite degenerative and gambling because you're essentially just gambling on the way others will view it. Uh, in the end, a lot of altcoins suffer from this, but I just want to segment when you're talking about higher risk plays like this. But nonetheless, the reason why I bring it up is because you're seeing in this project the fusing of tokenomics and just straight up games. Like this tokenomics is like a game. And if you guys are the you know top of your class AAA students, you'll know that we're talking about Priya or Priya. I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, but you can see here it's down 25%. This has been probably the most highly requested coin uh, from my, uh, my, my Telegram group, uh, which has gotten quite degen centric uh, over the last few months. Um, but regardless, we have this coin and you can see it popped up to about 70 bucks. I think it was really cheap at the beginning and now it's really dumping down here to about 30 bucks. Uh, at, that's a brutal drop, right? And this is why I call them degen coins and why they're so, so risky because they pump like mad, but then they absolutely go down like a lead zeppelin or a lead balloon. So let me go ahead and make sure that my face isn't blocking this uh, because these tokenomics are just crazy. I'm actually going to kill my webcam for a second because there's just too much on screen um, to see in the way they set up this, this website. is just pretty hard to read if you have my webcam up. So here we have the tokenomics of Priya. And this the reason why I'm bringing this up again, guys, I'm not saying to buy it, don't buy it, don't invest in it, I don't care. I, I personally don't have any, but I want to cover it because it's just conceptually interesting, right? It's conceptually interesting. It, it's something that's worth discussing, right? I'm not telling you to buy it. I'm just telling you it's interesting to discuss, right? Two different topics. So essentially the way this works is you have this burn and you have these cycles that they've created where it starts at a uh, hundred thousand tokens and it works its way all the way down to uh, what's its minimum 10,000 tokens. So it starts at a hundred thousand works its way down to 10,000. Um, and it does it in these cycles. Um, and it has all these like little logarithmic cycles and three cycles. I don't really know what the value of showing all these cycles are, but you can just see here that it's supposed to go down all the way down to 10,000 and then it's going to pump all the way back up to 100,000 and it's going to start inflating the supply and then it goes back. And it's got all these crazy rules. Uh, there's 1.2% of 1.25% of every transaction burned, 0.85% of every transaction goes to an airdrop, 0.5 goes to the owner. Um, but what's really interesting here is there's an inactive burn system in place. So if you don't do any trades or interact with the ecosystem for 30 days, I believe, 35 days, then 25% of your tokens can get burned just like that. You lose by being inactive. And if your inactivity lasts for 60 days, then the burn rate increases to 100%. So you lose all of your tokens if you don't trade for 60 days. This is part of the reason why I'm not really a fan because it's like almost taking it a little too far, this whole gamification thing. Um, but they're saying that they have uh, you know minimum amount of uh, per trade transfer of 0.25% uh, of the balance of the airdrop wallet. wallet. Uh, they have all these rules where they're essentially trying to create this gamified system that requires people to constantly move their funds and not remain stagnant. It disincentivizes whales and it constantly is burning and penalizing and putting things in an airdrop wallet. To be honest, there are so many rules here uh, that I would recommend if you are interested in this project, spending a very long time researching it. I personally researched it, I was amused by it, but I kind of steered away from it because it didn't fit with, it just seems so experiment experimental that I didn't know how to even touch it, right? It's like plutonium, this thing. But it's interesting, and so I thought I'd bring it up to you guys because this is the quintessential direction of the degenerate market that is cryptocurrency, which is essentially completely gamifying, completely gamifying the simple act of 
tokenomics. And I can see stuff like this continuing to develop. You know, you saw stuff like this with aggressive staking and unstaking penalties, aggressive, you know, long-term staking benefits and gamification of that. There's a whole bunch of projects that do that. Then we got the aggressive uh, sort of deflationary stuff with locked tokens, like you see with Core. Then we saw a whole bunch of clones of that. Now we're seeing stuff like with Vox, uh, which was another interesting tokenomics model. And now it's evolving to this Priya thing, which is again, creating, uh, this is almost like a game, a token game. And there's there's a, probably metas and, and best approaches for this. So I just thought I'd show this to you guys because this is kind of the state of the Uniswap casino land, which is looking at these absolute mind boggling kind of tokenomic stuff, which, you know, it, it takes on more of like, almost like a video game with money. Um, which I think is cool, but again, extremely risky. And you know, just like you can lose in video games, you can super lose with this. So just understand that uh, this is kind of a, a new direction that I'm seeing emerge in the Uniswap ecosystem. And something that I thought was interesting enough to bring up here, again, I'm not saying to buy it, I don't own it. I think that it's extremely risky and it most likely, most likely will dump like crazy either now or at some point in the future. Um, but it could also go on quite a run. I don't know. I really don't know how to evaluate this, uh, but people have been requesting my opinion on it. And that's my opinion on it is that this thing is just absolute, absolutely wild. But I thought it was interesting enough to talk about. Um, don't really want to cover these articles. Not interesting enough. Um, I did an interview on Altcoin Daily, guys. If you guys are fans of Altcoin Daily, please check it out. They're super awesome. Obviously, you guys probably already know about it. Uh, but I did this whole interview, and it was it was amazing just to talk about all of the the market with them. They're great interviewers, and I ramble a lot. So if you like seeing me ramble, you'll love this. Obviously, I retweeted it. Um, you can find it on my Twitter, uh, t.me or, or Twitter. Uh, dot com slash elio trades and the link for that is not in the description because oh yeah it is in the description it is in the description um so uh you can just go ahead and check that out there if you guys aren't following me on twitter by the way it's a great way to connect with me i'm talking about coins i think way before they end up being discussed here on this channel because it's so much easier to tweet about things when i'm interested in them um also join my telegram groups if you really want to get that base level of chat we're talking about all these crazy coins way before they end up on the channel uh so Priya is revolutionary. Yeah, that's one approach to it. I think it's I think it's interesting. I think it's experimental. I don't think it's revolutionary yet. Um loved your interview with Allcoin Daily. Thank you, Pink Summer. Um I love Dash. Dash it up. Dash it up. I don't hold any Dash. I don't hold any Monero. Um I'm I think the privacy coin, I've, ever since I've been in crypto, I've been hearing privacy coins are the next big niche. Privacy coins are the next big niche. I personally think if there was going to be any regulatory action, it would probably come to privacy coins first. I'm also just not convinced that people care that much about privacy. So I don't own, I don't own or invest in privacy, but I could be wrong. Who knows? Uh, talk about RVX, bro. Um, maybe I will. Maybe I will in the future. I like the project. Elliot, I was thinking about getting into alt once BTC reaches all-time high. Well, the biggest problem is, uh, oh, you're talking about at 20,000. Yeah, you'd imagine that that would be a bit risky too because probably BTC at all-time high, it's going to go one of two ways. It's either going to dump like crazy or the whole world is going to pile into BTC and it's going to go like crazy. And so alts might actually, that, that might be a terrible time to get into alts. I'm not sure. Um, we'll, we'll have to see, right? Uh, diversity is key. Diversify, own Bitcoin and alts. That's the easiest way. Um, but I'm definitely not turning my back on alts because if we saw what happened throughout 2017 as Bitcoin entered into price discovery, uh, well, if it's anything like that, alts will absolutely rock it. I think you're seeing alts perform really well on the back of Bitcoin, and that's really, really exciting. To me, it validates this theory. What are some of the hot smaller coins of the 2017 bull run? How much did they go up? 100 million market cap, 500 more? I'd be curious to an analysis their price. Yeah, that's a great question, Lucas. So let's go back and check out some of the hottest coins of 2017, which was, of course, Ethereum. We had uh, NEO was really hot. We had XRP. Uh, was really hot. Uh, we had uh, EOS was really hot. Obviously, uh, you won't be able to chart it because that was their ICO. Um, we had, uh, what were the other super hot ones? I mean, Tron. <laughs> Look at Tron as well, exploded. Uh, and what you'll see will probably shock you. I don't think that this is necessarily, you know, it's almost too easy to show these charts because, yeah, look at the Ethereum chart throughout 2017 as Bitcoin, as Bitcoin broke up. Remember, Bitcoin broke to new highs at the end of February in 2017. And what we see is Ethereum goes from about 10 bucks 
to by the time we're in June, Ethereum's at 400 bucks, so 40x, right, out of Ethereum in the first half of 2017. And then we get another huge blow off top and it ends up making its way up to, you know, 14, 1500 at its peak, right? Yeah, 14, almost 1500, right? And so from 10 bucks in the beginning of 2017, Ethereum made its way up to 1500. Now, is that a fair comparison? Is there any altcoin quite like Ethereum? Probably not. So don't want to like tie your altcoin hopes to Ethereum. Well, let's look at let's look at Neo, right? Neo is another good example. Let's rewind here to the beginning of 2017. Let's look at how it performed while Bitcoin was in price discovery mode. And obviously, throughout the beginning of 2017, it was you know had far more modest gains. We saw here we have January, and it's at about you know 12 cents, right? And it kind of sli slightly gains, right? It really just holds on. And then as Bitcoin explodes right here at the end of February, we see very modest price action, but it does move. It does move almost 100% up. Very, you can't even see it on this chart because it goes so parabolic after. Um, but if you're seeing it at 10 cents, remember that Neo peaked. Neo peaked at about 200 bucks. 10 cents to 200 dollars. I know. Take your time. The math is confusing. There's a lot of zeros there. So. What are alts? What are the destination? What are the destiny of alts? Of the good alts? The trending alts? Of course, S XRP. Let's do XRP. It's a fun one too. Um, here we have. So we have XRP, right? And these were already big coins, but still, even better. We have them at you know XRP. Just call it a penny because the math is just going to get hard. Call XRP at a penny. And then as we're entering 2017, then by mid-2017, XRP is at 40 cents, 40x, right? Even though it's really more like an 80x because it was at half a penny. Then once we get this parabolic blow off top, who knows if we'll ever get this kind of parabolic blow off top in the alts again. I personally think we will. And that'll happen when Bitcoin really ends its run. So when Bitcoin really ends its run, and this happened right after Bitcoin pulled back off 20K, and it was pretty obvious that the party was over and that it had gotten rejected off its parabolic movement, well, then alts went absolutely berserk. A lot of that Bitcoin money found its way into the alts, the faster price reactive assets. And so you saw you know, Ripple go up to four bucks, which is another 10x from there. So from one penny up to uh, $4, you have a 400x, right? 400x, even though it was about half a penny. Call it 1,000x, right? 1,000x from, from uh, XRP almost. <laughs> Absolute insanity. So do I think alts will do well if Bitcoin does well? History says yes. History says yes. Um, all right, guys. We've been going for almost 50 minutes here. Let's ask a few more, answer a few more questions. Phantom. Good, but again, the, uh, yeah, I know, I posted the wrong link to Twitter because I had some tech difficulties. Sorry for that again, guys. Um, uh, steak, I don't know if this is Unistake or if Steak's different, um, but I like Unistake. I'm not sure about Steak. Um, YFI, no comment, no opinion. Octo releasing their own decks this year. Yep, we talked about Octo. Uh, thoughts on the big Chinese exchanges all getting busted? Is Binance going to be getting... I would say that any futures exchange is in danger. And I got this news from the lawyers when I was trying to set up my own futures exchange earlier this year. And we were told that they're clearing out the field for an ETF. And so I would say that Binance is very much so next, if you will. Binance is next. However, I think they've probably set their stuff up a little more decentralized, a little more intelligent than BitMEX and OKX, which would hopefully lead to them still processing withdrawals and stuff and giving the uh, users time to get their funds out in the event that Binance did come uh, under scrutiny. I couldn't imagine them not, right? Hey, Elio, do you have any thoughts on Axie Infinity? Uh, I like all of these sort of, you know, NFT games. Uh, Axie is definitely more game than just NFT uh, compared to others. But obviously, I think their gameplay is pretty simplistic. But I like what they've done and they've accomplished. I think they're on my good side for NFTs, but still have a lot of work to go on creating a gaming product that is mainstream. All right, everybody, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Sorry for the tech difficulties at the beginning. Appreciate you rocking with me. We had over 1,000 viewers in here. If you got value out of this, if you got value out of the stream, do me a favor and smash that like button. It's a free and easy way that you support the channel. And of course, it really, really helps the YouTube algorithm show this content to more viewers. If you guys aren't already subscribed, we're doing daily cryptocurrency content and altcoin content in specific. And now that the market's heating up and we're seeing the exact same breadcrumbs that led to the 
parabolic moves in July and August, well, I'm getting really excited to start covering some of the most undervalued opportunities in the space. We're already seeing my calls on Teller and Dia, or not really Dia, but Teller, and for sure, Octo did really well. We're seeing the other um, oracles perform really, really well. And so I'm, ex I'm excited for what could be another phenomenal oracle season. And along with that, we'll see another slew of undervalued opportunities, I believe, in the DeFi market. So if you've hung around through the crash of September and you haven't been soured, well, then you passed, in my opinion, the first test. Is this the beginning of an unbridled alt season again? I think it'll go a little slower than last time. But in my opinion, the market is looking quite generous. And of course, if we get more stimulus, that would be a huge green flag for this market for a significant period of time. Again, I'm personally expecting fireworks in 2020, and so I remain internally optimistic that we're at the beginning of a life-changing cycle here. And if that's a value to you, then I encourage you guys to subscribe and put that bell notification on so that way you're made aware when I put out new content. Again, covering these undervalued opportunities in the market is really what I live for here on the channel. And if you're excited about that, I encourage you to subscribe. As usual, remember that each and every comment is entered to win your very own Ledger Nano. I thank you guys so much for rocking with me. And of course, I'll see you very soon on the next episode.